Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I'm loud enough. Thank you. So, Professor Louise Maury, Professor Magnus, um, and friends at CHEER and uh, Sussex Asia Center, um, everyone else, many thanks for inviting me to make this presentation uh, at this seminar on Gender and Asian Studies this afternoon. I think some of you may be familiar with a bit of my work because I did present the, this, the, this paper in its seminal stages uh, about two years ago, about a year ago. Um, so it's wonderful to be back in Sussex in this critical and dynamic milieu of activity on higher education in particular. Okay, we are all aware that universities today are part of political and knowledge economies wedged within a kind of a local and global uh, vortex of local and global transformation. So if we are to contextualize higher education in Sri Lanka, um, um, then we could say that those of us living in Asian countries and as talked about by Lynn a while ago, we can no longer ignore the compulsions of the forces of neoliberal globalization and what we can perhaps consider to be the resulting processes of acculturation in universities. The impact of these neoliberal impulses has been discussed extensively in public and academic fora. And as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, I would like to highlight the turn towards the market and profit making and aspirations to become entrepreneurial universities, the output orientation and the demand for international ties and MOUs, competitiveness and the pressures to perform according to global ranking indexes and indices, the valorization of business, of management, medicine, law and STEM subjects as well as the corresponding marginalization of the humanities and social sciences, the conversion of professors into managers and students into consumers, the in incessant and relentless uh, assessments of academic work according to quantifiable criteria, and the increasing indications of academic merit being equated with the funding brought into the universities. While such an acculturation or uneven cultural interchange and adaptation may impact on women in higher education in diverse ways, including their marginalization in terms of resources and opportunities, we must not forget that universities are functions with, uh, also function within national and local dynamics. So these dynamics may affect how and to what extent universities acculturate to the dominant forces within higher education and may be of particular significance when considering women's participation in higher education. Uh, this includes the impact of conflicts and natural disasters on the regular functioning of uh, universities. That was also pointed out by Lynn in her presentation in, about Myanmar, and that's the case particularly in Sri Lanka. The power dynamics of national politics, which may have seeped into universities and led to politicization, and institutional dynamics that particularly affect women. Ideologies in, of nationalism, ethnocentrisms, and patriarchy, which may intersect in insidious ways to depress and women's rights and freedoms. Um, the, there are organizational power cliques, old boys networks, and gender micropolitics, which may alienate women within higher education, sexual and gender-based violence that may regulate women, patriarchy, dominant masculinities and femininities, which may spill into student subcultures and lead to student unrest and violence. So to take a little brief look at women and gender in higher education, and I'm, I'm not giving you the full statistics, but just to give you the highlights, women's access and participation in state higher education has been increasing steadily during the last few decades. The University Grants Commission statistics of 2014 convey that in Sri Lanka, women undergraduates constitute 62% of those admitted to universities, while conversely, men uh, comprise only 38% of the total figure of 25,200, fueling the argument that university student populations 
are fast becoming feminized. The decreasing trends of young men not entering universities needs to be researched further as it problematizes the weight and validity of higher education for young people today. Moreover, what can be the tangible outcomes of women's access to higher education in view of present day underemployment and unemployment of university graduates? Now, when examining the choice to study and gender configurations within academic disciplines, women tend to be a majority in all faculties, numbering from 50% to 80% in some faculties, except for engineering, where you have 20% of women, sciences 49%, and computer sciences 48% in 2012. Uh, there is no data available that is di disaggregated by ethnicity and language uh, and other differentials at the moment. But when it comes to women's strength in numbers, uh, um, and when you look at higher education, there you find then that there is a reversal in higher education leadership. There is a paradox of unprecedented levels of women's participation at undergraduate level, yet low representation in positions of influence and leadership in higher education. So let's just take a look at a, a table. Um, um, and just to highlight a few things only, um, this is the percentage of women, 154 members in university councils, 10 women, 6%. Similarly, 15 universities, 15, uh, uh, there's only one woman vice chancellor, constituting 6%. Uh, vice chancellor, uh, sorry, chancellors, vice chancellors, the same, deans, 86, of which 9 are women, 10%, heads of departments and so on and so forth. So suffice to say that at the end of the day, you're talking about a kind of a pyramid of inequality. Um, consequently, as argued by the Lutz and Guterri, it is possible for men to exert dominance without numerically being in a majority. And I think this situation uh, highlights that. Um, the objectives of this paper are to provide a brief overview of Sri Lankan university context vis-a-vis -vis gender and access to higher education, to discuss the significance of the practices of sexual and gender-based violence in Sri Lankan universities in affecting the overall quality of women's participation and experiences in higher education, and to consider the complicities and contradictions as well as the challenges and complexities in addressing SGBV in Sri Lankan universities. Um, the paper is based on a review of available literature, findings of a semi-structured questionnaire on SGBV and ragging uh, amongst 80 stu university students as well as 20 qualitative interviews with women students in three Sri Lankan universities. The reports and outputs of a series of national consultative workshops on preventing SGBV in universities organized by the Center for Gender Studies at the University of Kalania. My experience of 25 years as a feminist academic activist at the University of Kalania in Sri Lanka. And of course, the limitation of this paper is that it focuses only on SGBV relating to students. Um, right. So sexual and gender-based violence in universities. Despite its datedness and its limitations, a definition of sexual and gender-based violence that is founded on the UN Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women um, is useful due to its acceptance in many quarters and because of its varied cultural uh, reach. It includes sexual and gender-based, uh, physical and sexual and psychological violence occurring in the family, physical, sexual and psychological violence occurring within the general community, and physical and sexual and psychological violence perpetrated or condoned by the state. And section A and B of this definition is of particular relevance to universities. Now, I just want to give a brief uh, overview of some of the legislation and international standards and national policies that are of relevant uh, that Sri Lanka has subscribed to and ratified. And I would like to underscore in particular uh, the Sri Lanka's penal code sections on assault, assault, rape, and sexual harassment, the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, and in particular, the prohibition of ragging and other forms of violence in Educational Institutions Act. Um, 
as of being uh, as of being uh, uh, legislation that you can really uh, take into consideration when addressing sexual and gender-based violence. Now, let me just um, um, a, a, or rather go back. As suggested earlier, women's access to and participation within universities have been <coughs> compromised by the practice of sexual and gender-based violence, a hidden practice in Sri Lankan universities. Its incidence is generally underreported and its perpetrators underpenalized. The slide gives the range of SGBV in Sri Lankan universities taken from existing data and interviews. I think the slide has gone a little dry, but that's fine. OK. Um, let me uh, begin with murder. Um, two women undergraduates were murdered on campus, in, on, in my campus premises, during my own career of 25 years in, at the University of Kalania. One was killed by a rejected suitor in the early 1990s, while the other by a rejected boyfriend in the 2000s. And all this raises critical issues vis-a-vis -vis women's autonomy and agency within intimate relationships. Assault and battery, women respondents report physical violence that includes slapping, kicking, beating, and the use of weapons in intimate partner relationships. Assault also takes place under the guise of ragging, and I will come to ragging in a little while. Transactional sex and sexual bribery, um, respondents report that sexual bribery or transactional sex includes sex in exchange for good grades by male lecturers in particular, compulsory intimate relationships in exchange for protection and safe passage. Uh, safe passage meaning from raggers within, uh, within the university, particularly during your first year, and male company for nighttime travel. Furthermore, respondents also talk of sexual coercion and blackmail. Women students are not allowed to break off romantic relationships once they're in a relationship because they are threatened with violence, exposure of compromise uh, of their non-virgin status, internet posting, data transfer of compromising photographs, including uh, nude selfies um, and uh, videos and so on, given the premium on women's virginity in the community. Sexual harassment, there is reportage of looking, touching, commenting, exposing genitalia, requesting sex, spreading rumors by strangers as well as fellow students. Sexual harassment with IT and props, these include SMSs, emails, pornography, sexist jokes, videos, photography taken without consent as well as coercion to supply nude selfies, stalking by strangers and uh, potential lovers and ex-lovers. Psychological violence, particularly Gunawadhan and Veera Singh talk of verbal and emotional abuse, um, threats, deprivation, humiliation, forced isolation, uh, enforced gender roles within intimate relationships, and ragging. Ragging includes psychological and sometimes physical violence, transactional sex, sexual harassment, sometimes leading to suicides. Now, here it is useful to examine the socio-cultural um, hegemony of the concept of sex as male entitlement, which seems to dominate not only the perpetrators of sexual and gender-based violence, but also the victim survivors. A recent study conducted by KIA International uh, in four districts in Sri Lanka conveys that most men who reported the perpetration of sexual violence were motivated by a belief in male sexual entitlement. Over two-thirds of women believe that a woman cannot refuse to have sex with her husband. Uh, moreover, 58% of male respondents of the CARE study, that is more than one in two men, agree that the use of violence, viewing it, uh, agree with the use of violence, they view it as an expression of masculinity or maleness or manliness, especially in connection with the family. Now, this ties in with understandings and aspirations and expressions of what can be considered a form of hegemonic masculinity. And I would cite Cornell and uh, Mr. Dan Kimmel and, uh, on that. A hegemonic masculinity to be seen as a dominant symbol, belief, discourse, 
performance and a practice rather than a fixed character. Now, within universities, such a hegemonic masculinity may include the co-option of a steady supply of different women students to cater to the different needs of men students, spanning study needs, the provision of food, romance, etc., or the arrogation of student political leadership, or the imposition of moral and dress codes on women, and I'm citing respondents on interviews on this. Consequently, it is equally important to examine the dominant notions of emphasized femininity, uh, um, especially Cornell and Messerschmitt, on what could be construed as hegemonic femininity within universities, given that some of the discourses found on campus vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis, uh, gender stereotypes. Now, we have a respondent A of students from three universities makes this link be between femininity and confronting sexual and gender-based violence. <clears throat> when, um, she says, whenever we confront men, they think it is extremely derogatory to apologize or accept their behavior as wrong. What men expect from women is to accept catcalling and other forms of sexual harassment as natural, so they want women to be silent about it. If a woman raises her voice, uh, she is called unwomanly, lower class, etc. This is what happens every time I confronted, uh, that is sexual and gender-based violence. The men simply stated that they were men and they could, not they could not practically be second to a woman. They also said that I was too haughty. Now, while this student is discussing the resistance to those who harassed her, the subtext of her speech communicates the enforced vision, uh, version of hegemonic femininity or what can be defined as an ideal for women in universities. Such a femininity presumes and validates a hierarchical relationship uh, to hegemonic masculinity and thereby guarantees the dominant position of men and the subordination of women, which seems to be founded on the submission to and acceptance of sexual harassment in this instance. This may be one reason for women undergraduates to consent to begin romantic relationships, to be coerced into sex, and to sometimes be forced or blackmailed into enduring these relationships, as revealed by interviews, uh, as well as a survey amongst medical students. Now, let me quickly move on to ragging. How am I for time? OK. Um, the rag season, which lasts two weeks 40 years ago, now covers three months and occurs more or less with university license. The law takes ragging as a punishable offense and is defined as any act which, is causes or which causes or is likely to cause physical or psychological or mental injury, prohibition of ragging and other forms of uh, violence in educational uh, institutions act. It delineates penalties for sexual harassment grievous hurt, verbal or written threat, causing injury to person, to reputation or property, restraining personal liberty and other freedom of, uh, and uh, freedom of movement of a student or member of staff, and occupying management or exerting control over an educational institution. Now, you can, of course, uh, see similarities between ragging and hazing, but ragging has led to severe psychological trauma, physical violence, permanent injury, and prevention, uh, and uh, led to related murder. It has led directly and as well as indirectly to student suicides. Now, here is a um, kind of a record of deaths and injuries due to ragging reported in the media from 1975 to 2015, where you find uh, students committing suicide. There's been murders. There's been uh, people who have... Uh, um, fought against rabbing, being um, beaten up, and so on and so forth. So um, I may not linger there, but the purposes of ragging, and I, I just want to highlight that students' interviews eliminate the stated purposes of ragging as establishing acquaintances and romantic relationships providing campus orientations or renamed geographical locations as per the university subculture, introducing freshers to the campus subculture, establishing a bond amongst undergraduates, 
instituting respect for senior students or te uh, teaching juniors their place in the university, equalizing pressures class-wise or uh, the given socio-economic disparities or geography-wise given a rural-urban divide or language-wise given socio-cultural class differences between English and indigenous languages and personality building. Consequently, the students who conform to the practice indicate that despite the intimidation and the violence involved, they are made to feel a, a vital, sanctified and integral part of the university community, as expressed by student respondent B. This complex bonding could be one reason why, despite the rag traumatizing pressures as they enter university, these same freshers would in turn go on to become raggers in their second year on campus. So here, ragging cannot be read solely as an aberrant undergraduate practice. I would argue that ra ragging is a key constituent of Sri Lankan university student cultures or subcultures as acknowledged and labeled by the students themselves. Now, Similarly, Alison Phillips has worked exclusively on uh, university subculture here in the UK, where she talks about dominant masculinity or ladism or lad culture, and defined it as a pack mentality evident in activities such as sport and heavy alcohol consumption and banter, which is often sexist, misogynistic, and homophobic. Another example is the subculture of heightened sexuality and sexual activity amongst first year students in Kenyan universities, which also pose a high risk for HIV AIDS, uh, given, uh, 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 given certain sexual behaviors. Stuart and Jefferson talk of youth subcultures as symbolic or ritualistic efforts of challenging and resisting the powers of the establishment and bourgeoisie hegemony by willfully adopting threatening behaviors. The Chicago School links such subcultures to delinquency and criminality, yet often the perpetrators are assumed to be above and beyond the reach of the rest of society. And this has proven to be a serious impediment in tackling the problem of ragging in Sri Lanka. In this paper, I have only stressed some of the salient features of undergraduate subcultures in Sri Lanka as it relates to SGBV. Um, firstly, the Sri Lankan su student subculture is argued to be an undercult uh, or an undercult class vis-a-vis -vis society and a counter class vis-a-vis -vis the privileged academic class. Now this is an interesting feature there. The discourses condemning and inciting hatred of the so-called privileged academic class is a significant feature of this underclass in establishing and organizing and legitimizing itself and its cause. The following anecdote conveys the organized nature of the RAG, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the student union. A few years ago, the Center for Gender Studies at the University of Kalania carried out a departmental campaign to, against sexual and gender-based violence and ragging on the basis that ragging was a form of violence uh, against women by men. Within a week of this, uh, or, or within a week, this resulted in reports of increased ragging of women students by women students, which seemed to be an organized attempt by the dominant student union to distort the issue and portray ragging as gender neutral. This reiterate that despite compromising a majority, the uh, a majority in terms of number, or rather, despite comprising a majority in terms of numbers. Women students are in a minority within the decision-making structures of student unions. Nevertheless, women are at the forefront in student protests, often used as political fodder, as claimed by student respondent B. So, university power holders tend to ignore ragging in general notwithstanding its regularity and widespread prevalence. In severe incidents, they may pay lip service and or deal with ragging on a case-by-case -case basis. This is because institutional politics and micropolitics come into play given that academic staff is often divided on this issue. 
While some academics unconditionally oppose the rad in principle, there are others who condone it as historically uh, being part of Sri Lankan university life. And I quote, it is not so bad. We have, been all, we have all been through this, and we have all survived. Uh, there is a divergence between what could be seen as the liberal and the legal approaches in addressing the RAD. The legal approach welcomes tighter surveillance and control with closer patrolling by marshals, police posts inside university premises, CC cameras in public places, identity checks, um, public posting of student identities, etc. On the other hand, the liberal understanding uh, opposes formal surveillance and control of universities due to the possibility that it would, and actually it does, open up the universities to political scrutiny, to regulation, and the possible persecution of non-conforming individuals. So, despite the activism of individual academics and departments and faculties, uh, universities as a whole have yet to take serious institutional measures to, for, of prevention and redress when it comes to sexual and gender-based violence. Yes, certainly there are circulars that tell us how to deal with ragging in universities in particular, but no one really conforms to them. Consequently, I would argue that there is a culture of impunity surrounding ragging and SGBV in universities that retards women's full and or equitable participation in higher education. Such a culture is not prevalent only in universities but can be related to the impunity with which sexual and gender-based violence is treated in Sri Lankan society in general as well as the hegemonic masculinities and femininities found in society and the environment created by decades of violent conflict in the country. Thus, the neoliberal expansions in higher education, the inclusion of women, and now the numerical predominance of women in universities, I would argue, have taken place on unequal and inequitable terms. And sexual and gender-based violence is one grim contributor to this inequality and inequity. Thank you very much. Thing, uh research on higher education leadership and uh, women in <coughs> South Asia. And we'd like to start off by just putting a little bit of context. We've talked about the Asian century. What do we actually mean by that? Well, in terms of um, the, the six countries in this study, which are listed there, these account for 25% of the global population. This is a huge region, a huge market, and in very, very aspirational in terms of the higher education system's structures. The undergraduate population has in increased hugely, and as both Lynn and um, Maitri mentioned, uh, has become so-called feminized. So 31 million undergraduate students, 13 million are women, which is a massive increase. And what is very noticeable about this is that women are entering higher education in the region, as uh, in other regions, as undergraduate students. And that legitimates a policy silence around gender, because so many policymakers feel that gender is a dead issue. It, we're living in a post-feminist, or as Sarah Ahmed would say, we're over uh, gender. We're over gender equality. So therefore, we don't bother to look at it. We ignore it. So the women are be, are be, have become a major new market. Uh, and the, the, one of the reasons behind the expansion is the massive rise of the middle classes in this region. And women have been part of this expansion. So there's been a movement, as with the rest of the world, um, from this planned scarcity, this elite provision, to higher education being a claimed form of citizenship. And colleagues like Simon Marginson, et cetera, say increasingly in Asia, higher education is linked to the good life, the notion of the good life, and escaping from poverty, from agricultural economies, to IT, to more fulfilling uh, work, and higher incomes. So there's this kind of linear uh, relationship between engaging with higher education and the rewards that it can, can bring. But in all this, and all this aspirational economy, 
gender appears to be a disqualified discourse. And as both our previous papers have said, a particular disqualification is around leadership. So, this just is not working today. <laughs> That's it. Okay, great. So, let's start off with some provocations then. When we're talking about uh, identifying women leaders, what is it when we look at women but people don't see in terms of leadership potential? Why don't they see it? And what do current practices reveal and obscure? So how do we make women intelligible as leaders? How are women being seen? And our evidence suggests they're constantly being seen as deficit men, fake leaders, frauds. But um, we're also, we've argued, in, uh, we're going to argue today and in everything that we've written, that it's a two-way gaze. Uh, yes, women might be being rejected, but women are looking at leadership and are viewing it in terms of use Judith Butler's phrase, unlivable lives. So some questions that we're posing are, what narratives are currently circulating about women's capabilities for leadership? But also, what narratives are circulating about leadership insofar as it's being perceived, conceptualized, <laughs> classified by so many women as undesirable? to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the evidence that contributed to the study. Uh, it was a three-phase uh, study, the first involving uh, literature and uh, policy review, uh, also a review of, um, to, that was to look at the research evidence and the discourses in policy, a statistical review of uh, data on uh, women's participation uh, in higher education employment, uh, f from lecturer through to um, vice chancellor, uh, and then 30 interviews uh, that were conducted, um, 19 women and um, 11 men, uh, from um, with uh, people working in higher education from six countries in South Asia, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and uh, Sri Lanka. Um, of those 30 interviews, we try to cover a range of um, different employment categories, although um, the majority were with uh, senior academics, uh, 24 were with professors and above, to up to vice chancellors. The interviews focused um, on questions like what makes leadership attractive and unattractive to women, um, what enables and supports women to enter leadership positions, uh, the personal experiences of being enabled and impeded from enter entering uh, leadership. So in terms of the uh, analysis of policy, as we've said before, um, gender uh, appears to be a disqualified um, uh, discourse when it comes to women working in higher education uh, in the region. Um, time and again, looking at higher education reports uh, and the data uh, on higher education, uh, gender was a concern for female participation as students uh, in higher education, uh, but was often not reported uh, for, um, uh, for women working in higher education. The dominant discourses, uh, picked up on Lynn's initial slide, was one of the knowledge economy. Um, higher education uh, was picking up on, on um, uh, things like uh, good governance, quality assurance, um, concerns about the uh, digital economy, uh, and also uh, for improving participation in STEM subjects. Uh, the, these were seen in terms of these modernizing nations as the key areas that higher education should develop in. Um, there were very few uh, research-based studies uh, focusing on women's leadership in the, in the area. Uh, where there were studies, they were often uh, gender uh, couched in gender-neutral language, uh, with no concern for gender. Uh, interestingly, there were some professional development initiatives in the region which focused on leadership, again, did not have um, a gender focus. And that included one, interesting, funded by the British Council, <laughs> rather paradoxically, uh, a few years ago. Um, so in terms of statistics, uh, there was a major lack of gender disaggregated statistics, as I've said, 
um, in, uh, in relation to uh, women's employment in higher education. We found no linear trends in women's representation. Uh, the numbers of women academics might have increased, uh, but the distribution of male to female academics is relatively unchanged in uh, an, a region where higher education is expanding massively. Um, as Marjorie has pointed out, uh, there are significant disciplinary uh, differences in women's representation uh, and also um, uh, a progressive stripping out of women's participation uh, as we move up uh, through the different uh, grades of employment. So they're absent from senior leadership. Um, so just a couple of slides uh, showing you uh, some of the details of this. Uh, thank you, by the way, to Daniel Layton, who is here at the back of the room, uh, for his help in preparing the statistical data. Uh, that was marvelous, Daniel, uh, really helpful. Uh, this is from um, uh, data provided uh, through the British Council, uh, initially gathered, I think, uh, with World Bank uh, support. Uh, focusing on Afghanistan, these are the numbers of women's, women academics from 2004 to 2012. Um, they have increased slightly, but in general, the participation percentages are unchanged over between 2004 to 2012 at 14.5%. Um, so uh, the distribution by gender remains unchanged. The wider story of this um, data is that it is not publicly published. Uh, this was secured through the British Council, um, and no further analysis of this was possible um, by, for example, uh, discipline or by employment categories. Uh, so big, big gaps in the, the data that was available. There are lots of theories of pipeline. Um, uh, you know, the, the more women at the bottom will feed into women getting to higher leadership. But the data we did uh, were able to obtain. Um, kind of disconfirms that pipeline theory that women will get there just by uh, their uh, increasing participation at the bottom of the ladder. Uh, we see it's pretty erratic um, uh, how uh, women um, are um, uh, from year to year. These, this represents just three years, uh, but it, they go. These women's participation jumps up and down uh, pretty erratically. It's not. There are no linear trends here. Uh, but this also shows that you have uh, quite significant uh, gender disciplines, uh, disciplines um, differences by discipline. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, and in disciplines like um, engineering, manufacturing, and construction, um, women are uh, much less uh, prevalent than uh, present than men. Um, and then again, as Maitri has pointed out. Um, you, uh, as you move up through the ranks, uh, women might, in Sri Lanka, uh, this is one of the areas where women have historically been more present, as Maitri said, very um, increasingly feminized. But uh, whereas women are equally re represented at um, lecturer level, by the time you get to professor level, uh, they are much, much less prevalent, uh, only 27%. Uh, and then you get to vice chancellor level, and the numbers drop uh, even uh, even more. Um, the statistics here, of course, are hugely subject to variation. Maitri just quoted for Sri Lanka uh, a figure of 6%. But of course, when 6% represents one person, it only takes a couple of people to uh, come in and out. And these have uh, and these, these are not often, these statistics are not reported in um, the official, in, in government reports. They come from just you know, examining websites and so on. So there we are, handing over to Louise again. Okay, so a major problem with accessing statistics, and we're really grateful to the Association for Commonwealth Universities, who our colleagues are here today, who were some of the original uh, compilers of statistics on gender in Commonwealth Universities. OK, so. We have this major absence, this, this, this gap, this policy silence, absence of statistics. But we have, our uh, participants had a huge amount to say uh, about the issue of, of, of leadership. And we, we uh, divided up some of the themes as, as, uh, as follows. So I had a lot to say about recruitment, uh, about their attachment to research, about authority, gender divisions of labor, exclusionary networks. But the area that seemed to generate some of the most heat 
was about the culture and the hostile cultures. And we asked women what attracted them to leadership. And what was so interesting is we, 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 we managed to get very little data. They had very little to say about the attractions. Now, we did interview some vice chancellors. And uh, I think it's important to say that uh, many of them were from very privileged backgrounds, the senior women, but the vice chancellors were from extremely privileged backgrounds and mentioned how they had been uh, assisted and navigated through the system. But on the whole, when we asked them what attracted, there was no energy. Some of them talked about power, values, rewards, recognition, but they didn't say very much. When we talked to them about the disattractions, we got pages and pages of data, uh, which led us to think that there is a very powerful, effective economy of leadership in higher education. And we drew, uh, we've, we've used Sarah Armand's work to help us theorize some of this, and uh, particularly the, uh, the, the, the putting affect back into the picture. So affect we know has historically been dismissed, in, particularly in Western thought. There's the Cartesian dualism that feelings, emotion, the body are in opposition to logic, to rationality. Work that Valerie Walker Dine has been doing for years. And it's been so devalued in binary thinking. And yet when it is actually uh, included, it's associated with the denigrated, the spoiled identity of femaleness. So it's assumed somehow that affect doesn't affect men. So the absence of affect is not seen as affect. But it's been revisited uh, more recently in feminist theory. And feelings, different feelings, tend to stick to certain different bodies and objects, as Ahmed would, uh, would argue. And uh, the affective economy is a form of capital. It's intensified and it accrues through circulation. And it's integral to the production of social and material realities. Now, recently, Sarah Ahmed has been working on willfulness, the willful subject. And she argues that feminists, feminism has to be willful. Um, and we've been looking at the data in terms of this theoretical framework. And Ahmed talks about fragility and being willful in the face of fragility. And what we found was that leadership was often experienced for women as fragile. We're not saying the women are fragile. We're saying their relationship to leadership is fragile. It's precarious. And it's very conflict-ridden. And as Ahmed talks about this, she, she, she uses the metaphor of flow and how if you go against the flow, you produce a lot of conflict. And so many of the women we interviewed talked about being in opposition to the flow. They were the other. They were the different uh, bodies. They were the bodies out of place. They constantly being uh, reported being seen as other, being seen as different. They had to keep navigating all these different wills. And the power of the sociocultural context was overwhelming uh, for these women, that everybody had a say as to what were gender-appropriate pathways. And if women opted for professions, for careers, for the life of the mind, and then for leadership, they were seen as going against the socio-cultural wills and what was seen as appropriate for them. It was also suggested that such major transformation and identifications and struggles were required to enter leadership, that women really didn't feel that it was worth the bother. So, as Ahmed would say, refusal, refusal to aspire can be a, for, a powerful form of resistance. So, it wasn't just that women were all being rejected, but many of them were strategically making decisions uh, not to enter leadership because they saw it as very hostile territory leading to unlivable lives. And this required a kind of willfulness. Now, going back to this notion of fragility, women were positioned as broken leaders. They weren't real leaders. Uh, they were, um, as this a female pro-vice chancellor from Bangladesh uh, cited, that it was just predicted that when they had a female vice chancellor, she would fail. And the predictions produced the failure. And it's very interesting, if you look globally, 
uh, the default position is male. And there have been many universities across the globe that have had women leaders. When the woman leaves, it defaults to male. Uh, look at some of the high-profile rows that there have been. Uh, University of Plymouth, a female vice-chancellor. University of Uppsala in Sweden, a female vice-chancellor. Big, high-profile conflicts, grievances, disciplinary measures, etc. So women somehow seen as high risk to a point, and everybody kind of waits for them to fail. And as the male professor in Pakistan was saying, that this, they're just not the, the the panels are not looking for women. They don't think of they don't think of women as effective leaders. So willfulness is also a kind of audacity. You have to stand up and be counted. Look at me, high visibility, which is countercultural for many women. Uh, as uh, Maitri was saying, women are heavily socialised in most cultures to avoid. Oh my goodness, to avoid visibility because of all the the risks of violence, etc. So there's a kind of um, disrupting the flow and impeding male entitlement if you stand up and be counted. And so many of our, uh, our participants described their um, experiences in terms of a kind of zero sum. It was seen as if women wanted to be included in leadership, that was damaging men. And very similar, <laughs> similar arguments uh, relate to the feminization discourse with women students. Lots of data about clashes of wills. The mother-in-law seemed to be the object of <laughs> considerable concern here, representing tr the tradition. But mothers-in-law often policed the boundaries of what was gender appropriate. Again, one way. Um, now, women looked for safe spaces. And one of the safe spaces was often research. They, they uh, felt that that was an area they could excel. They could, uh, they would be safe because their research would speak for itself. But those using uh, Ahmed's notion of attunement, there were a lot of narratives of being out of place, of not being attuned, of not belonging, of being in oppositional relationship to the environment, to the culture, to the expectations, a kind of shock therapy that always happened when, women, when, when, met, when people saw women in leadership positions. Um, we talked a lot, uh, Maitri talked a lot about hegemony, hegemonic masculinity, and some of them gave quite graphic descriptions of how they were interviewed. And it was assumed that the kind of... Ma that the, uh, um, Attributes associated with dominant and hegemonic masculinity were what were required for leadership. So you had to be ruthless. You had to be detached. You had to be very, very hard and strategic. And as this uh, female assistant professor from India said, you've got to look as if you can kill something at interview stage in order to be seen as a leader. So just to sum up, because we're running out of time, but... Very few women talked about neoliberalism, but they named its functionalities endlessly, particular, particularly, as Lynn was talking, the audit culture, the league tables, the prestige economy, the fact that if you are a leader now, anywhere in the world, everything you do is in the public domain. You're constantly assessed for your performance in relation to the dominant indicators for the league tables. So these performance cultures are making uh, leadership extremely uncomfortable for very many women and men. Women also talked about being the other, the non-attuned. They talked about disrupting the symbolic order. In so many cultures, it's assumed that women follow men. Uh, women don't lead men. Women are several stages behind. And this is being beautifully uh, theorized by colleagues in China and Hong Kong about the third sex. So the educated woman, the higher educated woman, is being classified as the third sex because she doesn't fit the gender binaries. But so often we heard women say that there was limited opportunity to make a difference, to make changes. The scripts were predetermined. They simply had to rehearse and learn them. Which led us to conclude that women seem to be saying that they lack the capital either economic, political, social, or symbolic, 
to redefine the requirements of the field. They simply had to be counted in and perform within the dominant uh, indicators. So men and women seem to have very unequal claims to leadership. There's the entitlement versus the oppositional. Women are being rejected. We had a lot of evidence of how women who wanted to enter leadership couldn't. But we also had a evidence of women being pushed and coerced and only getting into leadership because they really had to. They were very reluctant. But we had a whole group of women uh, who were refusing and self-excluding. And what we noticed was that w whatever women did, they were in the wrong. So they were criticized for being volitional subjects, whether they were resisting or aspiring. And we had a lot of data about pushiness. Uh, if women were aspiring, they were dismissed as being pushy and self-interested and vulgar and breaching the uh, propriety, sexual propriety, uh, by being very proactive and networking. That was seen as being very transgressive. So change then, we're saying, gender is not a, just a noun, it's a verb. We do gender. Gender gets relayed in our everyday practices. It's not just about counting more women in. The underrepresentation is a huge problem, but the solution isn't simply to count more uh, women in to a system that is very, as um, uh, Maitri was saying, which is still very male-dominated, regardless of numbers. So what we're saying at the end then is it's not that women need to change. We don't need to cognitively restructure women to make them more aspirational. We don't need all these women's empowerment courses, etc. We need to revision leadership and try to get it so that we get it we move away from this restrictive code, this restrictive set of scripts and make it more generative, generous and ultimately gender free. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
two in the country, one in the early uh, 70s, one in the late 80s. Uh, we've had uh, the ethnic conflict spanning about 30 years of our nation's history after uh, post-independence. So definitely there is a, a, a connection between bragging and uh, uh, general conflicts in the country, but I don't think it has been theorized as such. But I would say what what is what we should really take note in recent times, which I didn't really go into in my presentation, is that uh, the student unions have always been dominated by one particular student group, which is the um, a political group the, which started off with a very charismatic uh, uh, student leader, uh, Rohana Jayavira, who was who was involved in student revolts and then. Uh, finally got killed in one of the revolts. Now, there we have the JVP at the forefront of student politics from about the 19, uh, late 60s and 70s. But when it comes to now, you find that the JVP has become a mainstream political party. And it is a breakaway from the JVP, which is now got a stranglehold on student politics in universities. Um, and it is this group that has gone on to organize themselves. And it is a very organized kind of practice, which was the point I was trying to make. It is no longer, when, when I was a university student, it was just a case of you know groups coming and dragging you. There was no organization as such. But now it's not the same. It is a very organized, a very disciplined within the system, uh, within the system of student politics uh, uh, practice that is taking place as dragging. So, in a sense, I would like to see it more in terms of having very political objectives um, and so on, rather than in relation to uh, the conflicts that have taken place and, are, and so on. OK, the second point being was on, um, yes, the disappearing women. Right. Um, I, we don't have any trace of studies as to whether women enter marriage. I, I don't. My sense is it is not that. But women, women who have been educated are, uh, if they can, they will be working. I don't think, in, in my sense, I'm, I'm not citing any statistics. I'm, it's my feel that they, they, because women do work very hard, um, but particularly educated women. It's more the fact that we have so many unemployed graduates. And I was looking for the statistics to cite it for the paper and I couldn't find the current statistics. So there are, you know, varying statistics like 40% of graduates uh, um, uh, who have been passed out, there's 40% unemployment and so on and so forth. So I don't have a statistics as such, but it, it's more that there's a lack of jobs and because, and that is for both men and women because of the very high expectations from higher education because of the fact that you feel that you need to enter into the job market at a particular level um, with a car, with a phone, with a, you know, the, the more, more kind of corporate expectations from the public sector, because a lot of graduates are looking for employment in the public sector, given that it is going to give you a pension at the end of the day. Thank you. Yeah, just, uh, you know, I think, I think in the, um, in terms of the disappearing women, I think, I think, uh, in a, a place like Burma, where it's very recently, in many ways, opened up to sort of uh, global competition. There's people coming in. There's a lot of jobs being. There's a lot of businesses starting up um, in the capital city and in a couple of the others. I think it's a very. It would be a very interesting piece of research mm -hmm. to see where women are going. I think that there's in a, in a study that we commissioned um, last year on um, um, on teachers, new teachers, you know, in uh, teacher education colleges. They were asked why they wanted, you know, what were their ambitions um, in terms of education. It's very interesting because uh, the women said they wanted to be teachers. The men said they wanted to be um, to work in the township education office and then the district education office and to join the bureaucracy behind the education system. And so I think that, that within education, there are very, very different sort of uh, conceptions of roles for men and women. In terms of the commercial sector, I don't know. I do know that sort of uh, people have told me, I mean, again, it's very anecdotal, 
but people have told me that uh, in the marriage market a degree is important. Um, I personally, I don't, I don't sort of know. I haven't seen any data on that, um, but uh, it's certainly a big gap in our understanding um, there. Um, certainly, the sort of the, the levels of women in higher education in in uh, Myanmar have been going that way for some years. Yes, I could probably just add uh, in terms of um, uh, the way women drop out of uh, higher education and different as they go up uh, different employment categories. Uh, our respondent spoke about the nature of the academic workplace, uh, partly the masculinized cultures, uh, but also the ways that um, combining um, the administrative burden and maintaining one's research became increasingly impossible for a woman who was trying to also maintain commitments to family life. Uh, so it's the kind of 2424 kind of work culture of the academic workplace um, that um, becomes increasingly problematic for women given their additional burdens. Uh, so that contributed to it. Um, it's, uh, but the, the hostility of the um, culture of uh, management uh, was something that many of our respondents um, talked about. Just, just quickly to add on the disappearing women, uh, you mentioned there hasn't been research in, in Myanmar, but there has been a lot of research done on that in the UK. And I went to a paper recently by Peter Elias and Kate Purcell at University of Warwick, and they found exactly the same here in, in, in the UK, that you know, the, the, the value of the capital differs depending on who holds it uh, in terms of its, its exchange value in the labor market. And there, is, there are discriminatory practices in the labor market there's a gender pay gap. Uh, uh, women, ethnic minorities, take longer to get into uh, their first post after graduation and earn considerably lower. And the gender pay gap internationally is put at between 14 and 20 percent. So there are a whole range of cultural explanations as to, to why women disappear. Thank you. I, they're all very interesting presentations, but I want to pick up on the uh, <coughs> the first one from uh, Myanmar, partly because I'm a social work educator and I was lucky enough to travel last year in Myanmar. And um, I was completely struck about by um, gender roles there, amongst many other things that I was struck by. And I think your work on social justice and education um, in Myanmar um, and particularly for me as a social educator, where social justice is, you know, written into the international definition of social work, and social work is now beginning as a profession um, in Mandalay. The um, one of the things I was struck with, uh, and I just wanted to ask you to comment on on this, um, Lynn, was um, in relation to religion, um, especially now having just come back from Vietnam, which is so different. The the power of the of the monks. Now, it's interesting because the monks have both led a social justice movement and have and still are. There are many young, very active monks, monks who've been, um, who've been uh, very um, uh, treated very badly by the government. Um, and yet there are monks who are clearly, I'm talking about male men, <laughs> who are clearly in control of education at all levels. And that's one of the things that really struck me in relation to children and schooling and the power of the monks and the power of the monks in relation to family life and the kind of rituals and dominance at that level of, of men. Um, and I, so I just wanted to, it was an interesting contrast in relation to the social activist monks and the uh, tradition of the monks who seem to be, you know, very much, I would have thought, resistant to any social activism that is likely to disempower them. I mean, I could talk about government, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to focus in on the monks. Um, well, I, th I think that, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I think um, um, monks have enormous power. Buddhism does um, across a lot of the country, and I think if you look at the sort of uh, you know the the work that's been going on with the sort of the, the textual textual analysis of the of, uh, school books, you'll 
find in there um, very Buddhist um, sort of uh, influences in terms of you know religious sort of uh, concepts, the sort of uh, male and female sort of gender uh, stereotypes and roles and socializations and of norms and etc. will be will be in there. But I would say that there are um, that Buddhism is being used politically. Um, it's a very political sort of arena, particularly more recently. I don't have very, very much experience personally of um, of the impact of that on education or higher education, but I see it in some of the um, Discuss the political discussions that have been going on. There's a whole sector, there's the monastic education sector in um, Myanmar that only teaches around, I think it's about 8 to, eight to 10 percent of school children go to monastic schools. Um, and they mainly cater for Buddhist, but other religious, uh, uh, other religions too, they can send their children to some of these schools. Um, but mainly poor Buddhist communities. It's highly contested across the other sort of ethnic states. I went to Kachin State, the northern one. The, um, it's a it's a conflict affected state. Um, I was invited there. The Institute of Education here was doing some um, research of, um, in Kachin on uh, language uh, and education, and the hostility around the table towards um, sort of uh, the national sort of uh, curriculum um, that's very Buddhist and very Burma, the, the, the major sort of uh, um, ethnic group. I mean, it was tangible. There was, I was quite shocked at sort of the, the level of, uh, of um, anger around that. So I think, I mean, in, you know, broadly, I would say, yes, it's, uh, it's very powerful. I would say it's being politicised even more. I think that there's a sort of there's a part of um, sort of Buddhism that's been usurped by um, politics in particular. That's quite extreme at one level, but it's also um, been you know there's a lot of support for it across the country in the Burma majority because of the social justice work that's gone on um, in the last few decades. So a very complicated but interesting space. Um, thank you all for the presentations. I really enjoyed all of them. Um, I also have a question for Lynn. Um, I was very struck by this slide you had of the plaque about the decontextualised role of um, higher education and the decontextualised vision for it, um, despite this long-standing history of students activism and pro-democracy movements coming out of universities in, in, in Burma. Um, and my first question was, to what extent is that decontextualized vision being driven by global actors and donors with a kind of um, global knowledge economy rationale, neoliberal agenda in higher education? Um, or to what extent is it being driven by by the government, sort of wary of um, disturbing that kind of history of student activism, and you mentioned that that this kind of um, the controversial nature of higher education is one of the reasons why it's been kind of marginalised in the education reform. So, yeah, which one, global or, or government, or a kind of collusion between the two? Um, and then I just wanted, secondly, to pick up on the question that you raised at the end about in a way, how to reorientate higher education to a more contextualised, um, socially engaged kind of role in society? Um, and, you know, is there a role for, for higher education collaborations in, in doing that? And two thoughts kind of sprang to mind. The first was um, we briefly talked about the lack of research around the social justice peace-building peace role of universities. And, potentially research collaborations with universities in Burma or, you know, other places in, in kind of generating that missing research, kind of um, engaging them in, in building that research base. Um, but secondly, also um, the role of regional 
social science research councils in the global south. So I'm not familiar with Southeast Asia or, or South Asia, but um, certainly, you know, in Africa, there's Codestria, in Latin America, Clasco, in the Arab region, there's the Arab Council of Social Sciences, a, a newer um, organisation, and they, they kind of, they do challenge this neoliberal global um, agenda in higher education and are much more interested in a kind of societal role of higher education. And I was just wondering, is there a role for kind of interregional collaboration, um, kind of South-South academic collaboration to kind of build up that, that, that different vision? Um, Oh, okay. Um, so briefly, <laughs> um, I think yeah, um, I think that you know, um, touching on that, the first the first one was a question that we were talking about over lunch. Actually, the sort of the global, the international drivers for um, education reform dominating and subordinating the sort of the local um, sort of uh, contextual needs for higher education, the role that it can play in social justice um, and, you know, in a conflict-affected country and uh, uh, peace building and addressing some of the causalities of war um, through um, higher education. Well, I mean, my, my feeling is that, yes, it's certainly been, do um, it's certainly been um, heavily influenced by the de development community um, there. Having said that, I think that, you know, over lunch we were talking about how you measure... Um, what a successful higher education sector is in the world today. And it's very much sort of um, uh, influenced by, the, by rankings, by all these sort of you know, metrics that tell you this is what you need to have a sort of you know, a good education system, a higher education system. And I think those things people have reached for and says, well, this is the, this is the blueprint of a good university. Um, so I think that's primarily the driver, and not just for higher education, but I think for, um, you know, school edu basic education as well. I think people look at it in that way. Um, so there's that. I think it has been affected, but I think that's a global phenomenon. I think every education system around the world has, is impacted by what, uh, you know, a global neoliberal standard is. And ASEAN have very... I think, has, has adopted this too. And so the first driver for Myanmar's higher education is to, is to um, you know, align to ASEAN, that region, which is uh, part of that global system. So I think, yes, I, I think that um, the other question about um, international collaboration, can it um, support the social sort of functions and purposes of universities in a very contextualized way, I'd like to think so. <laughs> and I'd like to sort of um, um, really bring that into um, a, a debate because I don't see that so often in, um, you know, when I'm, I'm discussing collaboration opportunities um, with, you know, Myanmar but other countries too. I don't see those discussions happening and those things. I think people, when you know, universities from around the world, when they come in, they're looking at quite generally quite specific agendas, and they're not the broad functions of a university. And I think there's a whole space there that um, I think is very rich and a very important space to be dealing with in terms of internationalization, um, which um, I think is, is quite neglected. Okay. 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 Uh, I'm Murray Dunn from CIE. Um, uh, in relation to the last presentation, uh, the idea of willfulness was fantastic. I thought, well, that I can hear that. I, I, it, it's my lived experience in some sort of way. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm not being willful enough. I'm not sure. But um, I was just um, wondering about how it can work inside uh, places, how, how it does anything to address the gender binaries and particularly to highlight the masculine 
performances. I don't want to take away the space from talking about women, by the way, just to put that as a warning. But, um, and I was also thinking about the actual context, because it's not only about being in a leadership position in higher education, it's about what higher education is. So is higher education a context of employment, for example, or is it a context of a context of social action? And I think those those things might say different, give you different configurations of what leadership is and how that might be configured. So just more on that. Uh, I'm Kourish, PhD students, uh, working in the context of uh, higher education and looking at uh, gender inequalities, uh, class differences in higher education. Uh, actually, I don't have a particular question, but I have a suggestion, uh, if I may, uh, regarding the second uh, presentation uh, in Sri Lanka. I was listening carefully to that presentation, and I felt that, OK, uh, in the context of higher education, feminist is a very strong approach uh, that can be used to address uh, gender, class, and equalities in higher education. But also, if we go beyond that, uh, to me, there is a further issue, which is about, OK, there is equality there. We highlight that and we point out the issues, everything. But the main issue and the biggest challenge is that how we can illuminate that uh, the reality is that this equality exists. And for the people to, to perceive this as an inequality and injustice, and uh, in this sense, I would like to mention one of the uh, Bourdieu's concepts, uh, which is uh, symbolic violence, that I think can be used uh, along with feminism to highlight the ways in which we can uh, working on uh, starting to change perceptions about how the people uh, perceive realities, because if we don't have, um, for example, uh, uh, I use an uh, example from uh, Louise's presentation when she mentioned about the uh, uh, leaders and the issues that uh, why we don't have enough women, for example, in high leadership positions. And uh, that made me to think that, OK, we see that. but. Uh, somehow we don't pay so much attention in which that we put effort, OK, why really? Why not to have more women? Because in the society, there are bigger things. There are bigger powers in the societies that impose perceptions, people to believe that uh, it's fine. Uh, male leadership, male is dominated. And uh, so, we, so if we don't have uh, enough women, it's not a problem. Hi, thanks. I'm uh, Maya Onithan from the Anthropology Department. I was really interested to um, learn whether these um, sort of, in terms of cultures of uh, institutions, higher education institutions, and cultures of leadership, whether these may be differentially experienced across uh, women who take up social sciences versus women who might do, say, natural sciences, and, and, and how that might be sort of um, experienced. I mean, I'm just wondering whether those who take up natural sciences would face perhaps less or more, I don't know, but, but you know, whether you had some information on that and why that would be the case. So something a little more about breaking up those sort of cultures that, that you've been talking about. Thank you. Murray, wonderful. Well, they're all wonderful questions, but you really encapsulated a lot of our discussions that we've had recently. And to be very brief, I mean, when you talk about willfulness, 
one of the one of the observations we've made is that it goes unmarked in relation to hegemonic masculinities. So the 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 dominant male get their wills met without having to exert any pressure whatsoever. They go with the flow, to use Ahmed's me metaphor, whereas the willful women were constantly going against uh, the feminist killjoys, the the people that the uh, unhappy migrants, the people who disrupt the uh, consensus. And your second question about whether HE is employment or social action, that represented a huge tension for many of our participants, that many of them wanted to lead social action, but got completely sucked in and diverted and absorbed into the key performance indicators that related to their employment, i.e., the metric meeting all the uh, pressures, the performance measures, the metrics of the globalized prestige economy. And that was one of the reasons why so many women rejected leadership, because they felt they had very little agency, very little room to maneuver, very little opportunity to set any agendas. They were simply meeting the employment performance needs. On the STEM different uh, cultures, um, I suppose um, in the literature review there is uh, there are some studies of uh, women's experiences in in STEM cultures uh, and of their exclusionary nature for women. Uh, so um, uh, you know how working in a laboratory was you know was a really uh, alien uh, thing for women to be part of. Um, but another cultural differentiation was public and private universities yeah. and some big questions about what part the privatised higher education system is playing in gender equality. Is it actually off offering opportunities for women, because several of our very successful senior women were in pri the private sector, or is it actually diverting underrepresented groups into the periphery, the non-elite? Thank you very much. Um, I wondered, uh, knowing a whole range of different VCs and their histories, they appeared to particularly value the family culture from which they came. Um, it was often a family culture where they were brought up with boys and sometimes just females within the family to believe in total equality. They took it as read that they were totally equal and therefore they could go into anything because of this basic outlook. And I wondered if you'd ask questions at all about family cultures. Um, yes, we did. We asked about respondents' backgrounds, and um, uh, we talked earlier about the, the privileged nature of many of the backgrounds of our respondents, and there was a very, very strong sense of entitlement that came with the sense, yes, women have uh, can move into these spaces. But it, it does not mean to say that when they are come into um, positions of leadership um, that these are comfortable spaces for them to be in. Uh, so that one of the quotations we had up there was of a woman who was, you know, uh, in a VC position, uh, but talking about how, um, yeah, you can hear them saying, it's a woman, wait for it to go wrong. Um, so that kind of thing was uh, still something they had to struggle with. But yeah, very strong sense of entitlement. Uh, it's it's um, in, in some of our uh, respondents. Um, and uh, this is also, I suppose, changing with uh, changing family um, structures. Uh, as well. Um, yeah. But all, it's also pointed out to us on many occasions that this region has had a lot of prominent female leaders, political leaders. Sri Lanka had the world's first. Currently, we have one in Bangladesh. We've had Indira Gandhi. We've had ben, uh, Benazir Bhutto, etc. But when I spoke recently about this in Sweden, they said, yes, but these are dynasties who are very, very elite and very powerful who didn't have boys, who didn't have sons at that particular, those particular political moments, and would rather have 
their daughters occupy those positions than not occupy them at all. So, I mean, it's, it's hugely controversial here uh, about the intersections between gender and socioeconomic privilege. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for playing uh, both for the fascinating papers and to Louise and Barbara in particular for having helped organise this uh, event. And thank you very much also for all of your questions. I mean, I thought that there was so much uh, ideas uh, that we're going on today that we could have continued for much longer. And I hope that in the future, in fact, we can collaborate again and perhaps organize a longer uh, workshop around these themes because there's so many interesting things coming up. The final point, I think, especially fascinating about this distinction between intellectual family life and, and being elite and whether we need also to think critically about the way in which we're using the term uh, elite in these uh, discussions as well, <coughs> given the uh, complex uh, sort of intellectual uh, histories of uh, each of these different societies we've been talking about. So there's enormous scope to continue this discussion. I very hope, much hope.